This is Welcome to our General Session for Shaping and Futura Con Product. Um, my name is Alexis Jesus. I am the Events and um, Partnerships person. That's definitely not my title, but we're just going to go for it. That's who I am. Okay, yeah, if you don't already know. Um, and I have really, really amazing candidates today. Um, Mario Coim Garza and Elisa Levet. So I'm just going to read their bios and what they do and how amazing these people already are because they, right before everyone started coming in, they were already talking about products and everything going on. So um, I know we're, we're all excited to get this conversation going. So I'm just gonna start with their bios. Um, Mario is a senior data scientist and consultant at Prosocity. Did I say that right? Prosocity, yeah. Prosocity. <laughs> That's a weird name, we didn't pick it, so. <laughs> okay. um, at Prosocity LLC in Dallas, Texas. So Dallas, if you're in the building, um, shout out to you guys. Uh, he helps predict future events, describe what really happened, and decipher what companies should do next using analytics and ML. Uh, he's a native Texan and a newish dad. What, what is newish? What does newish mean? <laughs> she's she's still one years old. She'll be too soon. So like I, I've been calling myself a new dad for a while, but I'm not quite new anymore. So you're yeah. you're you're a whole new dad. You're yeah. <laughs> one years old is nothing. My dad still calls himself a new dad, and I'm 30, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> he says I'm always I'm always. Uh, bringing up random things or, or surprising him in many ways. So he always, I always keep him on his toes, which I'm sure your daughter will do. Um, so thank you so much, Mario. Did I miss anything in your bio? Nope, that's good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. By the way, your shirt, A1, loving it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> next, I'm gonna introduce Elisa Levet. She is a developer advocate at Zoom, born and raised in Mexico with a background in human nutrition and more than 10 years of experience Whoa, first and foremost, Elisa, we're just gonna have to have a conversation on the side about that um, because I am getting into human nutrition because there's just a lot of stuff going on in the world. But anyways, um, Elisa brings a unique perspective to her work in the tech world after pivoting into tech more than three years ago. Fluent in Spanish, English, and French, um, Elisa is not only a language aficionado, but also a coding enthusiast. I love it, I love it, I love it. Uh, her ability to communicate across cultures and platforms sets her apart in the field of software development. I love to hear it. Um, and I yes. am, oh, sorry to interrupt you, but I am actually a new age, I'm, I'm the definition of a new age mom because I'm pregnant, I'm seven months pregnant. So I will be new. Like. <laughs> We have new parents in the house and shout out to all the other parents in the house. We appreciate you guys. Um, congratulations, that's amazing. Do you know what it is yet? It's a girl. Oh, a girl, stop <laughs> my heart. Oh, I love to hear it, I love to hear it. So thank you all for joining us. We're really, really excited to get this conversation going. Um, obviously our session is called Shaping a Futuro Con Product, right? We are fully aware that product is important to the Latina community overall. And we have two experts on here ready to discuss this and just talk about why it's important to our community. So before we even get into the deeper dive of things, I'm going to start off with Mario and just like let him explain himself, of like what he does. Um, we'll just start there. Like, what do you do? And, and, and we'll go to Elisa right after that. <laughs> Uh, my day to day is I am a consultant for just a variety of clients that we work with. Um, I think I essentially do uh, whatever a client happens to need me to do. So uh, some days I'm developing predictive models for uh, like transfer patterns in customer behavior in terms of products that they transfer between. Uh, this is at a um, a grocery retailer that we're working with right now. Um, but then other days I'm helping to like stand up a BI platform for uh, like a pharmaceutical uh, manufacturer. And so it really depends on the day and the client, what it actually ends up being. And then sometimes um, I end up coming in and helping to develop a new product um, as a POC or as a, um, we've worked with startups to actually help develop the, the core product uh, offering that they have. So I, I've done a variety of things over the time that I've been at Precocity. And so it's been fun and um, always a tricky thing to answer exactly this question because it's always a different thing from day to day, which is what I love about it. Um, but I, on, on a regular basis, I am essentially um, doing analytical work, doing um, projects that are, are being requested by these clients to uh, answer questions about 
um, what kind of uh, things are happening with their industry at the time, with their uh, product demand. And um, yeah, so it, it's a wide variety of things. I, I develop in Python and R, and uh, I, I'm pretty involved in data engineering all the way into production uh, of ML models and uh, Sometimes I'm just offering answers in Excel if it needs to be there, but I, I do a lot of different things. So yeah, that's me. I love that. It sounds like the jack of all trades. And I think it's interesting that you're bringing up like whatever the, whatever you do pretty much whatever the client needs. So we'll definitely jump into like what, what you're seeing are the current needs of, of product mm -hmm. in general. Um, we'll jump into that right after Elisa talks about what she does. Yeah, well, I'm a developer advocate at Zoom, and um, I can relate with, to Mario because I do very different things every single day. I work pretty much advocating for third-party developers who are integrating with uh, Zoom, and that's what we were talking about before you jumped back in, in the conversation, that I help developers that are building apps using our tools. So like... Um, I would, I don't have like a day to day schedule. Every day is different. Sometimes I'm helping someone building with our um, video SDK. Sometimes I'm helping someone with our APIs or someone, I'm, sometimes I'm just helping uh, fixing bugs or troubleshooting uh, applications. And I do, I, I do work very, very close with the developer community in the developer forum. So I'm like, Every day is different for me and it changes. It can change like within minutes. Like I could be troubleshooting something and then I have to just jump on a meeting to try to fix this box. So it's it's quite interesting. And that's, uh, that's an, uh, as Mario said, I love that, that. I love that I don't have one day that looks the same. I think that's interesting, right? Because, okay, this is a little off topic and I, I know we're definitely going to jump back into the product, but you know, there's a lot of um, Latina individuals and folks that they're like, yeah, I never have one hobby because I was raised to just do so many things. And I think this is the first time that I'm genuinely hearing you both say, yeah, no, I love this. I love not having one thing to do. And I've actually found one thing or I found like a position where it allows me to just go multiple routes. And that is like very unheard of. Like even till this day, even though I'm like marketing and events, I'm like, do I, like, what else do I want to do in life? Like, do I want to go somewhere else? Do I want to try like coding? Do I like, so I appreciate you both for finding something that you truly love and that it's constantly changing and it's up to your speed. I think that's really, really important to stress. But aside from that, um, let's dive in back into the conversation that I promised we would in regards to Mario Product marketing is a great bridge to get there. John, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm looking to it. But um, no, Mario, let's jump in. I know you were talking about doing multiple products for different clients. Like, how do you see, like, are there any trends that you see that a lot of clients are going to? What What's what's happening in the product world? So, I mean, it really depends upon uh, the company that I'm, that I'm talking to, what trends that I'm picking up on because some of them are consumer facing, some of them are B2B companies that are providing services or products directly to other companies. Um, so the one that I'm working with the most right now is this grocery retailer. Um, and they are a big deal in Texas. They are kind of, we're just getting um, a lot of these uh, grocery stores showing up in Dallas Fort Worth area, which people are really excited about because um, it is uh, really well known. Um, especially in South Texas, in the San Antonio area, in Central Texas, um, particularly because they are very good at addressing um, the specific preferences of the customer base that they have. I mean, uh, they offer products, they offer uh, food and, uh, and, and a lot of fresh items and a lot of really good um, tailored to that audience kind of products. But um, that you I just have that, to tell yeah. us who it is. <laughs> Who is it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you could Google know, it and it's not very hard to find out. I'm, I'm just sharing. I'm just going to say that their tortillas are just probably like literally my parents grew up in San Antonio. And every time they come back, they come back with tortillas from this specific chain just because it reminds them of just where they grew up and, and the, the regular grocery store that they would go to to have them. Um, but um, that has been a kind of key a uh, value driver for the way that they are going about their assortment uh, selection and, and the way that they go about um, the, the stakeholders that they identify um, when they go through that process of trying to update on a regular basis 
um, the assortment that they're they're choosing for their products. And so um, it's almost like uh, they may not be the oracles of one of like the Hispanic community or the, the Latin community that they know um, are a huge component of their product base, but they recognize that uh, the vendors that they're working with have a really key relationship with their customers. And they also recognize um, within themselves to organize those relationships before they even get into the boardroom, before they even get into the meeting, they recognize these are the people who have that ear to the ground, who have those relationships with um, community members that will make our decisions much easier and make them uh, much more valuable. Um, because I, I think there, there's no benefit essentially to trying to make these selections from an Ivy Tower, even I mean, I'm a data scientist. I love working with the data. I love working with something centralized and um, something clean to look at. Uh, but oftentimes the answers are not that clean and you have to get them from many different locations and find um, find a way to address each of those different uh, conversations in a structured way. And so getting those people in the room is a really key part of structuring um, that th those conversations to get uh, that work going. And is that is that in your B two like your B two B clients and in your like customer facing like is that like something happening in all in both of those things? I'm just curious in both of those settings. It's interesting because I think at the B two B client, um, it is a different approach. Um, just because I think the the relationships are are much more one to, like one to one. Um, it's a little bit le like it's it's a much more known relationship in most cases, um, and I think. Uh, the the it's a little bit more personal um and i i think the the unknowns are, are just fewer in that sense i think it really depends upon what what level of maturity that the company is because some of these companies that are very large and have a lot of pre-existing relationships um they they kind of uh i, I think they don't have to um, go through the struggle of figuring out exactly what that stakeholder co uh, composition looks like or what it what their uh, panel of experts ends up looking like. But I mean, the thing that we do as consultants often come in is to question those assumptions. We're, we're questioning um, whether they think, whether they have the right people in the room, because oftentimes they think they do, and it turns out that they don't. Um, in particular, especially if they're trying to expand a certain line of business or they're trying to um, change uh, their their processes in a well in a way that they just haven't been able to figure out, oftentimes because they just don't have the the right people to discuss yet. And so, in terms of like the the outward facing work that they're doing, um, oftentimes we do have to help them reconsider um, the kind of uh, customers that they are courting and the, and the kinds of uh, people that they're trying to reach out to. And fortunately in the position we're at, we're kind of a third party. We can help bridge a lot of those uh, gaps for them. And we can bring a lot of people together. We, we kind of end up being the host for meetings between different people that we know. And that's kind of uh, part of the benefit we can bring is we can, we can like make our friends, friends of each other kind of. Yeah. I love that. Elisa, I saw you shaking your head like to, to the, concepts of him being able to do so being a third party. Do you have anything to add to that? It seemed like you had, you, you agreed with something. I just couldn't. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, everything that Mario shared. And I just like, again, I work with um, working with the developers that build with our Zoom developer platform. I work with third party developers all the time. And sometimes we need to, as developer advocates, we need to uh, not only not only help them using our tools, but also probably identifying what are the needs for whatever they're building. Either it's like a, a web app or it's a mobile app. Like what are the needs? And sometimes it's not that it's our it's not that it's my job or something that I sh should be doing, but it's almost like something that comes natural when you are advocating for someone else, right? Not only for the third party developer who's building with our platform, but also knowing that these application or this product that they're working on is going to be out there right like what's going to what's what's going to add to the community what's going to add to the people around you what's going to be the benefit of it 
So yeah, like I, I again, I work with third-party developers every day of my life. So like that's it's like that sort of like I, maybe I shouldn't be telling you this much because it's not my job, but also like I feel like I have to because I'm committed not only to what I do at Zoom, but also to my community and to like women's rights and like everything that's like that I'm passionate about. No, you can say whatever you want. Okay, this is a safe space, a safe zone. So you're fine. Um, no, no, I appreciate your response in, in in regards to that. So, I guess my next question for you guys is like, did you guys envision yourself? Um, were did you mean to jump into product anything product related, or did you just so happen to land here? Um, because I think there's a few folks in our community that want to you know be involved in product but don't know how to go about it or like how to enter it. I know John mentioned product marketing, which I never would have thought of, um, but, but like how, where did you guys start out? How did you end up or land where you landed? Um, and then I'm gonna ask another question after that, but let's just start there. So we'll start with Elisa. Yeah, so I um, I started as of working just as, a, well, not just as, I started as a software engineer and that's when I uh, realized I kind of, I, I don't kind of, I love talking to people. I love being around people. I love helping people. So I found myself just like coding, coding and just like pushing PRs and like making it requests and whatever. So I, that's when I was working at another company that I loved. Uh, and then I found out about the developer advocacy team, who is a team that not only does the coding, not only like build applications, build products, but also that help other people. Right. So like that's that's how I made that jump and how how I ended up. So like it's I kind of looked for it, but also it was it was sort of natural. It happened to me like in an organic way because of the, my personality. I always worked with people before I work in hospitals. I worked. I was a server. I was a bartender. I was everything. Right. I was a nutritionist. So like I've always been working very, very close to people. And I I just ended like I found this position that was way more. um how can I say that way more like uh fulfilling? Yeah, like it's like it it it's it's uh, yeah, like it's it's it was just more appealing to me just because it wasn't only coding but also like helping others. That's yeah, that's that's it, helping others. <laughs> no, I love that, and it kind of even circles back to like the the first thing I mentioned of like how there's so many hobbies and so many things, but you're also doing something that you love and giving back to the community. So I, I love that. And I didn't even know positions like that, like develop, like I've never heard of your position before. I'm not gonna lie to you until you. And I was like, what does that even do? Like, what what is that? So it's good to hear that you can get the best of both worlds. Um, same question for you, Mario. I mean, I think for me, it was initially a little bit of an uncomfortable fit because I didn't know I, as a consultant, when I sort of began, um, I had come from a, a more direct role before as an analyst. I had been a uh, like a credit risk analyst for consumer finance companies. So I came from the finance wor world where the product was sometimes like really far away from what I was doing. Like I worked for General Motors for a while and I had nothing to do with vehicles or uh, how people interacted with them. But what I had to do was more of um, uh, develop the tools for the back office of General Motors to be able to sell vehicles. And what that kind of forced me to do in that position um, was to sort of re-envision what the product is and for who the product is actually being built because General Motors in that situation didn't just build cars, but they were also building a lending platform for all of the dealers that they had selling those vehicles. And they needed to have this successful uh, platform and these uh, basically this loan profile um, and, and credit offering that would enable these dealerships to sell those vehicles. And so in that sense, uh, these dealers were the customers and the product was this loan product that, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily think that General Motors is trying to sell lending products, but that, that's a big part of what they do. Um, and I think that got me into this, this mindset of, well, there are these like customers in all levels of business in all levels. It's not just sort of like I'm selling widget A to these product or to these customers out in, in the real world, out in like everyday people. There, there are customers receiving 
and seeking out these products at every level of the economy. And um, especially in what I'm doing now, I think I, I get to realize that in a lot of different ways over and over again, like I was saying, uh, with these customer facing companies, there is a big focus on uh, building out products that uh, uh, external customers that everyday people going to, sh to shop at a store or to use an app are, are interacting with. But at the same time, there are also other customers internal to a company at a different client um, that are wanting to be provided a product, sometimes just by a different department within the same company. Um, but sometimes it's another company that's providing only exclusively services to other uh, businesses. And so like in that sense, it it just sort of, I mean, I, I think like Elisa was saying, enabling people to sort of develop these products for each other in these interesting ways. Um, like it, it was just something that initially when I came in, I didn't have visibility of and I didn't really like understand. Um, and so I got kind of excited by that back end focus and that back end work because I realized like, oh, even if I'm just like delivering a dashboard that monitors this predictive model, that's a kind of product that there's a specific need for and there, there's these specific requirements for and iterating on what those, the, those product needs actually are or is something that I can do. I mean, I can imagine myself as a customer for this product that I'm developing by speaking with these stakeholders and um, they really appreciate when I sort of step into their shoes and be uh, and act as though I would receive this same thing and say, oh, well, don't you need this? Or what do you mean by this specific question and help to refine a lot of those requirements? Because um, I mean, there's a lot of cases where I'll come into a situation where um, there is a, a big picture idea in mind for, oh, we, we want it to be able to do this at the end of the day, but they don't have an idea maybe who is going to end up using it or how it's going to be implemented or um, using which specific cloud infrastructure resources. And I, I think um, those are obviously questions that people want to answer, uh, but they, they just want you to sort of stand with them as a customer for this product down the road uh, in order to realize that product being created. But it's very people focused. I mean, that, it's always at the end of the day, people focused. Yeah, I, I feel you on that. It's like at the end, you end up end up working for like to meet someone, you know, like right. what's, who this product is going to be for, who's going to be using this product. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, my God. My, my thing just kicked me out. I can't <laughs> hear you guys, but... You can. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask this last question because it was a question from the audience. And then I'm going to refresh my page and then I'm going to jump back in. But while you guys answer this question, um, I'll just refresh it. So someone said uh, in, the, in the audience, I'm breaking into product at large healthcare company right now, uh, specifically product operations. It is a new field in product and I would love to learn about your experience with this new field and product and if your company has a product operations team and how it functions. Um, I will start off with Elisa. Uh, feel free to answer that if you don't have, if you have an answer to that, I'll be right back. I'm gonna refresh my page. <laughs> so let me think about this, about this for one second. We do, we do have a product operations team for sure. We have like different products. Um, large health company so i kind of like i'm a little confused on the question like is it large health company who is so it's it's a new new product in a large health company yeah sorry it's uh it's in a large health company and it's specifically product operations is that okay. something that you guys have experience with is that something super new? I do I do not work closely with the product operations team. Like there are so many. I do work with uh, PMs and product managers and a lot of products, but I do not work just with one. So like my job is more like working with like all the tools that we offer, but I don't directly work with uh, product operations team per se. Okay. 
No problem. It's it's a good question at the end of the day. And For we sure. do have three minutes left. Um, Mario, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but if so, um, got three minutes and then we're going to hop off. <laughs> Uh, I mean, with my company, uh, we don't necessarily have our own IP to like provide operations for, but there are at other companies that I've worked with. Um, I've worked pretty closely with the operations uh, team that's providing uh, basically uh, the, ensuring the performance and the delivery of certain web application products that they have or um, certain software products that are currently being maintained. Um, what those teams I, I usually uh, end up working with is because I, I'm usually like incorporating maybe something new or trying to learn something about an existing design uh, or an existing architecture. And they're usually the architecture experts, I would say. Um, uh, I, I'm always really interested in finding out the people who implemented a, a certain product or who are in, uh, responsible with it because they know all the the nuts and bolts and they know where when something breaks down they know where to look um and, or if if there there's interesting data being generated from a process usually they know what what data like that's being dumped out into or something like that um and so i end up working with a lot of uh the operations engineers in in different companies that maintain the infrastructure behind the scenes and they maintain um, essentially just the function of the products themselves if they're uh, these software products for the most part. Um, and so they're, they're just interested in uh, not only reporting on what's happening uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and, you know, the, the usage and um, actually recording, you know, uh, clickstream, act clickstream activity or other things like that. Uh, but at the same time, they're often also responsible for uh, dealing with downtime problems um, or, other considerations like that. But one of the cool things that they do proactively is often thinking ahead of the time, um, what are these systems that we haven't looked at in a number of years? Or what are these things that uh, uh, are looking a little rickety that we could probably replace? Or um, considering a new infrastructure software that we can slot into existing places to improve. And oftentimes they're consulted for in improving um, functionality in a lot of places. And so like, it's interesting because those operations people in those situations often become allies to the product team to say, we have these existing products, uh, but we want to add this functionality in a certain way. How can we do that uh, by slotting in some different pieces to that design or that architecture? So um, yeah, that, that proactive like work is really fun. Right? Like they're kind of like auditors almost in a way, like auditing yeah. and figuring stuff out. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I hope, I hope, Whoever anonymous was that asked that question in the chat, I hope you got your answer. Um, but we are at time, and you know, feel free to connect with Elisa or Mario. Uh, they are very knowledgeable folks, and I'm sure that they can answer any other questions that you have. That half hour flew by so fast. Um, but, <laughs> but I wanted to thank you both so much for joining this panel today. And yeah, you know, please stick around for other panels going on. And I appreciate you both. Again, feel free to connect with both of these folks on LinkedIn. You could find them like in their speaker profiles or whatever the case. And we will see each other soon, I'm sure, because there was a lot of information spewed out. And I would love to have like a part two to this conversation. So thank you both so much. Thank we'll talk you. Soon. So nice to meet Bye. you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you.